Hello and welcome to The Big Picture. I am Tina Jha. External Affairs Minister S. Jay Shankar is on a four-day visit to the United Kingdom to participate in the G7 Foreign and Development Ministers meeting. It is the first in-person summit of the Foreign Ministers of G7, which comprises of Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, the US and the UK, plus the European Union. India, along with Australia, South Korea, South Africa, and the chair of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which is the ASEAN, have been invited as guests to this meeting. In addition to being part of the G7 foreign ministers meeting, the external affairs minister will also take part in several bilaterals that could include one with UK Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab and also with the US Secretary of State Antony Blinken. On the big picture today, we will talk about the significance of the first in-person G7 meeting in two years, which comes amid a pandemic, the issues that will be on the agenda, and what India's participation at the G7 meeting means. So to discuss all of these aspects and much more, I'm joined on the show today by former Ambassador Prabhu Deyal. Welcome to the show, sir. And Dr. Sriram Cholia, he's a foreign affairs expert. Welcome, Dr. Cholia, on this edition of The Big Picture. Ambassador, let me begin the program with you. So how do you look at this outreach by the United Kingdom, first to invite India as a guest to the high-powered G7 meeting? And what does this mean for India? Well, Tina, first of all, thanks for having me on your show. Uh, you have summed up the broad contours of the visit of the External Affairs Minister to the United Kingdom. Uh, let me underline the fact that the G7 now sees India as a very important dialogue partner. You would recall that India had been invited as a guest country to the 2019 summit, which was held in France in 2019, and which had been attended by Prime Minister Modi. And once again, India has been invited as a guest country to the G20 summit, G7 summit, which will be held in 2021, next month in June. So the importance of India on the global scene emerges from the fact that this grouping, which is a grouping of rich nations, which have strong economies, see in India as an invaluable uh, dialogue partner. Now, this summit will focus on issues like uh, uh, the COVID-19 pa pandemic, on climate change. So the foreign minister's meeting will be geared towards preparing for the summit itself. Uh, of course, I would like to underline the fact that uh, there's a lot of importance also to the bilateral aspect of the visit, because once the uh, G7 foreign ministers meeting gets over, the bilateral leg will start. And uh, this uh, coincides with the fact that uh, Prime Minister Modi and Prime Minister Boris Johnson will have a virtual summit tomorrow, at which uh, very uh, important uh, areas of cooperation will be discussed between the two countries, including, of course, the coronavirus pandemic. Now, I would also like to point out that the British government has uh, promised a lot of assistance to India and has already sent more than uh, 1,000 ventilators to Indian hospitals and uh, will be sending 200 ventilators and lots of oxygen concentrators and other such um, helpful items as part of its overall uh, assistance package. So on the one hand, uh, uh, the foreign minister of India will be taking part in the G7 foreign ministers meeting, which will prepare for the uh, forthcoming summit next month. At the same time, he will be having very important parlays with his uh, British counterpart in regard to bilateral cooperation because the two countries do see each other as very important partners in cooperation in all areas and will be, which will be further highlighted by the virtual summit which I referred to earlier taking place tomorrow. Okay. Uh, Dr. Cholia, so uh, what the ambassador says uh, that the invite to India as a guest to the G7 has been a continuous process. France did invite India in 2019, then the United States at last year's summit, which of course could not take place. So as the most prominent grouping of democratic countries, 
what role does the G7 expect India to play? Well, you highlighted uh, democracy, Tina. That's a key element, you know, binding the G7 together. In fact, it used to be called G8 uh, earlier, and they expelled Russia uh, for various reasons, including geopolitics and also the concern that it's not democratic. So this is really a club of rich industrialized democracies and common values and, you know, emphasizing democracy, human rights, this become very important, you know, cementing factor for it. Uh, the G20, of course, is a bigger grouping where China and Russia and many others are also there. Uh, and so are we as full members. And uh, as far as economic governance of the world uh, goes, uh, G20 has in a way overtaken G7. But G7 still has relevance because of this democracy factor. You know, it's a very unique club. And the fact that they invited India, Australia, South Korea, uh, you know, this is, of course, the same countries uh, and ASEAN also. Uh, indicates one that the summit that is going to happen um, uh, next month in Scotland will uh, have the heads of state of all these uh, outreach partners. So the same group has also been invited at the foreign minister's level. And people call it G7 plus three, as in like um, India, South Korea, Australia, making it G10. Japan is already there as a full member of G7. D10, as in 10 democracies. What does it mean? See, I think uh, they are saying that G7 will look at geopolitical priorities also, apart from what Ambassador mentioned, the uh, corona and uh, crisis and the climate change and such issues. They are saying that they will uh, come with a joint uh, proposal for tackling China, um, Russia and Iran. And uh, we don't have any, uh, you know, uh, animosity to Russia or Iran, but with China, we do have a problem. And so I think that's where the choice of countries, India, South Korea, Australia, Biden initially called for these to be part of, to be added on to G7 to make it D10. That's quite clear that the Western countries plus Japan are increasingly looking toward the Indo-Pacific. And so if you see the D10, the, the full uh, combo, then it's a mix of Europe, North America, and Indo-Pacific countries. So what it indicates is that these countries of the Western world, which is the core of G7, although Japan is there, are looking more and more towards Indo-Pacific as central. So the host country, Britain, of course, they have been talking about Indo-Pacific tilt. Uh, the British have done a review, internal review. They are now sending a carrier strike group uh, to the Indo-Pacific um, in, and uh, which, which will involve military exercises with India and uh, Japan and other Quad members. Uh, they are also likely to sign a military logistics agreement with India. So Britain is doing all the right things in the lead up to the main summit, uh, which it's going to be hosting. And um, the thing that the British are saying is we have to relearn the art of competing against states with opposing values. And the same Anthony Blinken, uh, Dominic Raab, all the counterparts of Dr. Jay Shankar are saying the same thing. There is a problem with countries that lack democratic values and we have to challenge them. So, of course, we are going to be selective on this. Like I said before, we don't have any um, grudge against Russia or Iran, even though they are undemocratic. But as far as this works, this values factor works in creating a common front and a geopolitical thrust in Indo-Pacific area, which will help us to counterbalance China, we will welcome it. So I think a lot of the bilaterals, as well as the main session of the G7 plus uh, three or four or five now, uh, those will focus on uh, the Indo-Pacific. And I think that is a welcome move because we want more players involved in this region to create a balance of power. And uh, I think China will be discussed uh, behind closed doors in very frank and candid terms because the Western world has arisen to the fact that China has become too big of a menace for them. And therefore, that is where the importance of India, Australia, South Korea and all these countries come in and ASEAN. OK, Ambassador, so uh, uh, there have been talks of expanding the G7 and Dr. Cholio also mentioned to include countries like India, Australia, South Korea and make it into a D10 grouping, which represent the largest democracies of the world. But do you see that formulation of D10 happening in the near future? Well, I really can't forecast anything in that context. But let me state what I said earlier, that the G7 already sees India as an important dialogue partner. And in fact, it does view Australia and South Korea quite the same way. So in a sense, this D10 formation is already getting into position. 
Now, from our point of view, it may be a little tricky when discussions are, um, are introduced by uh, the other G7 countries relating to Russia and Iran, because uh, as the professor pointed out, we have good relations with these countries. And we would not like to become a party to any controversial statements which the G7 summit might like to issue in regard to these two countries. Of course, as he pointed out, where China is concerned, we have very serious problems with that country. And if the G7 decides to take a hardline position, so much the better for us. Because I, for one, am strongly of the view that we must get international opinion strongly on our side and take a firm position ourselves where Chinese expansionism is concerned. But where the other two countries are concerned, we would not like to become a party to anything which is seen as being hostile by these two uh, countries because we have good relations with them, as I pointed out. So it's going to be a little tricky tightrope walking, but I'm sure that with the skill that uh, our external affairs minister possesses, he will be able to navigate his way through choppy seas also. Let me also mention that the focus of the foreign minister's meeting is likely to be on the coronavirus pandemic, particularly because it continues to plague the world in a variety of ways, and newer strands are appearing, newer strains are appearing from time to time. India is perhaps the most badly affected country at the moment, but surely this is a pandemic which can spill across borders and affect everybody. So it's very important that countries which are part of the G7 and other important guest countries which would be taking part in the foreign minister's meeting put their heads together and try and devise strategies for overcoming the uh, problems which arise from the situation. For one thing, they will be discussing the issue of uh, uh, you know uh, supply chains because ultimately it becomes very important for countries to be able to get assistance from other countries and equally to be able to send assistance to other countries where supply chains are very very important and at the moment there are certain factors like china itself for instance its expansionism which is coming in the way of these supply chains now the quad has been focusing its discussions in this regard and i think at the last virtual summit that took place this matter was discussed by the leaders and it's very likely that the G7 foreign ministers, followed by the summit, and of course the Quad summit, which is expected to take place in the sidelines of the G7 summit next month, will all focus their attention on how to improve supply lines so that in an era of um, COVID-19 and the, the pandemic, we should be able to help each other rush supplies and reach supplies in a timely manner. That is what I think uh, is likely to be the focus. Of course, there's going to be climate change, which will figure very prominently. Uh, India and the EU countries will be having a, uh, you know, a virtual summit next month. And I think uh, these issues will come into focus. So all told, the areas of cooperation, such as uh, coronavirus pandemic, uh, climate change will figure. And of course, problem countries where we have concerns about China, and we don't have similar concerns about Russia and Iran, which the G7 countries have. All these will form the package of discussions, and it will be interesting to see what is put out after the meeting takes place. Absolutely. Uh, Professor Tolia, so cooperation among democracies is something which we have seen during the pandemic is back in vogue. Also, to check China's ass growing assertiveness, this is perhaps in the best interest of the democratic countries which are part of the G7 and the guest countries which are also taking part in the summit. But since we are spoken about, uh, uh, talking about the D10 grouping and uh, which the ambassador also spoke about, uh, it's in the best interest of India, Australia, South Korea, because with the rise of Asia, if more and more Asian countries, currently there's just one, with more and more Asian countries joining the G7, it could add value to the diminishing relevance of the G7, isn't it? But what are the challenges in the expanse, expansion that you see? We saw US President Donald Trump was quite keen on an expansion, but 
Even then, it was unclear whether the expansion will be a permanent one. Yeah, look, I mean, small group cohesion in these um, international uh, groupings is, uh, is important. I mean, always consensus is harder to reach the bigger the group becomes. So internally, uh, some of the members may not be prepared to make it a G10 or a G11 or a D10, if you like. Uh, but um, in any case, there is a G20, uh, we, which also includes undemocratic countries. But the point is, I think uh, the outreach is more important than the formality. I mean, whether we call it D10 or G7 plus 3 or plus 4, if you include ASEAN, doesn't matter. Uh, there are some, uh, you know, doubtful fence sitters in these outreach, uh, you know, uh, party, if you like. Uh, one is South Korea, unlike Japan, which is, a, of course, very firmly ensconced in the U.S. alliance system and opposes Chinese uh, territorial aggression. South Korea has kind of refused even the past year. The U.S. was trying to coax South Korea to join the Quad as part of Quad Plus. Uh, in some form or the other. Uh, South Korea is tiptoeing around that idea because economically it's very heavily dependent on mainland China and it does not want to upset the trade and investment flows uh, with China. So that's, and the other group of course is ASEAN. And it's very important, their presence at G7 uh, as a guest countries, as a guest grouping uh, is very important because ultimately Quad plus the West, Western world, cannot succeed unless they get the ASEAN on board. It's because ASEAN is the real bone of contention. So these big 10 countries in the middle uh, between China and the anti-Chinese bloc that is forming. So they are all trying to woo the ASEAN and ASEAN also is highly dependent on China for many of its uh, economic uh, needs. So uh, even countries that have strong territorial dispute with China like Vietnam, Philippines, uh, tend to be cautious and not want to be seen to be allying with uh, the U.S. and a broader coalition against China. So I think one of the things for a task for G7 uh, countries, I think India is less um, confused now because we have more strategic clarity, especially since the LSE crisis we started in 2020. We are not fence sitting and saying we are going to be neutral anymore. No, there's no question of that. Uh, nor are we going to formally become part of an alliance. But that's OK. I mean, as I said, formalities don't matter. Whether we are formally inducted or not is less important than what are we jointly going to do. So Quad Plus, um, if we can have G D10 countries, all of them involved in some way or the other in joint military maneuvers, in uh, interoperability in Indian Ocean region, like Britain, the host is saying they want to commit more to Indian Ocean. France is there. It's a very important player in Indian Ocean for us. So uh, if we can then just expand this circle of like-minded countries, uh, democracies, and you know, which believe that there is a um, uh, currently a prevailing threat to the global norms. You know, the global norm is receding. Democracy is receding, uh, especially because of China's rise and power and influence around the world. So there has to be a pushback. So at that level, we have to find convergence and uh, do things together. Even with the virus, uh, you know, the vaccines, for example, um, the initiative of Quad countries to jointly produce vaccines in India. What if we can expand it and have all the G7 uh, uh, plus Quad, I mean, make it a D10 initiative with more finance being pulled in to enhance India's capability for vaccine manufacture. One of the official um, agenda items of G7 summit is this equitable vaccine uh, access around the world because they're all being criticized. The rich countries are being criticized for not sharing patents, for not uh, being generous enough and all that. So they are, there is a moral onus on them to do more. So I think they are looking to dialogue with India, especially, and with the rest of the Quad countries, because already we have an initiative under Quad, but how to expand it and make it bigger? Why, why only 1 billion doses of COVID vaccines? We could make 2 billion if the Europeans also pitch in money for it. Right now, the Europeans who are part of G7 have not joined Quad uh, initiative on this matter. So there are such kinds of you know points of intersection which will benefit humanity and also help us in our geopolitical goal of having a uh, Indo-Pacific and an Indian Ocean that is free of hegemonic uh, Chinese uh, uh, threat. Certainly. Ambassador, so one of the key issues that Dr. Tolio spoke about is to establish a shared approach among the world's leading democracies on equitable vaccine access. And that going forward is going to be one of the key issues uh, of the G7 meeting. Will this provide an opportunity to India to take its vaccine diplomacy forward? Well, India will certainly 
be able to familiarize other countries, if need be, about uh, whatever it has been saying in regard to vaccine diplomacy. That is to say that all countries of the world need to come together and act as friends in need to countries which need help. India has been doing that. And of course, now when India needs help, it is evident that the good we uh, did is coming back to us because countries wouldn't have been reaching out to help us in the manner that they are doing unless they had been very impressed by the fact that India had lent its helping hand to countries which needed such help. Now, in addition to the China factor, you know, a meeting like the G7 foreign ministers meeting, attended also by some other important countries like Australia and South Korea, and of course the Secretary General of the ASEAN, provide an opportunity to have meetings which are bilateral, but on the sidelines. I'm sure that India will have some important bilateral meetings with other foreign ministers on the sidelines. And there are a host of issues which India needs to sensitize them about in such an in-person interaction. For example, Pakistan. You know, terrorism from Pakistan is becoming a global menace, but it is affecting India more than others. So India continually needs to upgrade the understanding which others have of the terrorist-related situation in Pakistan and continue to upgrade their um, actions, particularly in the context of the Financial Action Task Force. Again, Afghanistan is going to pose challenges because the U.S. withdrawal will pose a whole host of new situations. So certainly these issues could be and would be discussed on the sidelines of the G7 uh, foreign ministers meeting, as indeed they will be on the sidelines of the G7 summit, which will take place next month, and where it is likely that the Quad leaders will have a meeting on the sidelines. So, in other words, while the main theme may be uh, the coronavirus pandemic and climate change and the other issues which have been tweeted by the British Foreign Office, at the same time, we would be able to take advantage of the situation and convey our views in regard to situations which are important for us. Of course, the theme of China will certainly be the preponderant one amongst uh, country situations because China is threatening because of its territorial and economic expansionism as no other country is. The Europeans are concerned about Russia because of Ukraine. But China's expansionism is of much glo greater global impact because all across the Indo-Pacific region, it is threatening the interests of the countries which are part of this region. So this, in my understanding, is how uh, the G7 uh, foreign ministers meeting with India and some other key countries taking part as guests will shape up the agenda for discussions, focusing on issues which are of importance to everybody, but at the same time also uh, taking advantage of such a meeting to focus on issues which are of great bilateral importance to us. Absolutely. Issues of geopolitical importance uh, for us as well as for the region. Uh, Dr. Cholia, one quick question from you, because it is a precursor to the summit that is to take place in June, where the Prime Minister uh, has been invited to take part. What can we expect from the main summit when it takes place in June? Because it comes amid a pandemic, of course, this will be one of the key issues. But apart from that, as the Ambassador has pointed out, what else can we expect? Well, firstly, format. I mean, just imagine the diplomatic circuit has been completely turned upside down due to the pandemic. There have been very, very few physical in-person summits uh, in the last uh, 12, 14 months or so. And uh, the you know summits uh, have been postponed or virtual summits. The limitation is the e-diplomacy is OK simply if you have got an agreement in place already and you simply give a pro forma speeches and then you sign it. Uh, or uh, just issue statements or joint declaration. But the actual dialogue, you know, the in-person dialogue, nothing can replace that, you know, technology cannot. So it's very good that Dr. Jay Shankar is personally gone and uh, is there in London. And hopefully Prime Minister can also go in person next month 
Uh, and uh, because that is where some of the wrinkles can be ironed out, new ideas, there can be some candor among the top leaders. So the summit is going to be very exciting, I think, because the idea of the D10 really hinges on this summit and it's going to be a landmark summit because in the past, the geopolitical environment was different when India used to be invited. But this time there is a more focus, uh, as I said, between the West and the Indo-Pacific countries in Asia. So uh, I think the, uh, the foreign minister is going to lead the spade work for the summit and for some uh, formal uh, announcements. And maybe there's a new pact around a few of the issues that Ambassador outlined. But most important is in-person summits have to return. And I think the British are gambling because they're saying this is a biosecure, you know, it's like a bubble they're creating at the venue uh, for the foreign minister's summit to prove that, you know, it is risk-free as far as the pandemic and uh, infection goes. Because top leaders cannot risk their, uh, you know, health at all uh, in this time of global crisis and national crisis. So summit uh, in person for it to happen, the foreign minister in person has to happen. So this is like a demonstration or a, an experiment in returning back to diplomacy as usual. So I think that's very important and that's worth watching because we have to maintain the sanctity of this uh, high level, you know, top secret, uh, you know, uh, exchanges and um, possibilities can only happen in in-person diplomacy. So we hope that this will succeed and we should welcome this format because without this, it's all just, uh, as I said, uh, mere formality and that is not sufficient to push uh, the agendas forward or to resolve conflicts or to create new consensus. Absolutely. Let's all be hopeful that by the time the summit uh, is to happen, the second wave of the pandemic will be over in the country, will be, uh, will have successfully uh, been able to tide over this crisis that we are currently in. So with that, I'll have to call it a wrap on this edition of The Big Picture. Thank you once again to both my guests for joining me on the program, sharing your perspective with us and our viewers. Pleasure having you on the program. Take care of yourselves and your families. To our viewers as well, I want to make an appeal. Stay at home if you can. Take all basic precautions. If you step out, make sure you are masked up. Maintain physical distancing. Wash your hands and face regularly. Stay safe because that is the only way to successfully beat the second wave of the pandemic, which is much more severe and wider in scale. So take care of yourselves and your families. That's it from us on this edition of The Big Picture. Thank you for your time.